Yeah. So I'll quickly go through these. Uh, do you see my screen and slides? Do you see something here on my screen? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So let's talk more about this. Uh, yeah, so the course name is Big Data A to Z, which means I'll be covering most of the tools and technologies which are related to building data pipelines. Um, yeah, and I'll be teaching you this the exact same way how you would be working in a company as a data platform engineer or a data engineer, because I did these the same way uh, at one point. So yeah, again, like a little bit of introduction about me. Yeah, so my name is Sai. I work as a data platform engineer at my community startup in Toronto. Before this, I worked on various data roles at Manulife, Sun Life, and Uber. Uh, and then I got a computer science degree. Uh, I also have a few cloud certifications. Uh, I also have a GCP certification, uh, yeah, which is a bit uh, advanced than AWS. That's fine. Uh, you don't need these to become a data engineer at the moment. Um, yeah, anyways, I'll be helping you with these. Uh, understanding what this is, what the components of a Google Cloud Platform are, and how you would be using this in your lab session. Um, yeah, and I really like explaining things in a simple way. I think I'll mute you guys uh, so that yeah, it's not a disturbance for anyone. Yeah, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself, okay? Oh, sorry. Oh, I think I can't unmute you guys. Uh, is this clear? Uh, hello? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, if you have a question, yes, please, un uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go back. Yeah, cool. And what is actually big data? So this is the first question what you have to understand or uh, this is the first place where you have to think on like what you're exactly doing so big data is nothing but i mean let me put this in a much simple sense so let's say you're let's say you're cooking for your family or uh, for yourself so let's say you have a backyard and you are actually growing everything out of your backyard so in this case sorry Yeah, you see, you still see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah. So imagine being a good cook who cooks for your family with vegetables out of your own backyard. So when you're doing this, let's say you're making a like fruit salad uh, and fruits are all from your farm. And this is like a normal classic fruit salad, which has like some strawberries, or some berries and some fruits and a banana. Let's assume that everything is coming from your farm. You can do it for your family because the quantity here is low. And also you do this like normally once a day, I guess. So it's not like too frequent and it's not too much. So this is fine. Now imagine doing this in a same rest, in a, in a big, very big restaurant, which has like at least hundred customers walking in per day, which means you have to like do this in 200 times. You're scaling it, which means you were using like a banana before. Now you have to use hundred bananas, which means you can't grow everything in your backyard or you can't like maintain all these. So what you do is you'll do with a different set of logistics. In a sense, you'll start importing them or start bringing them from a seller. And now you'll use much big storing space and then you'll serve it to your customer. Now, the, the key difference is you're doing everything at scale here, which means into 100 times. So this is ideally the world of big data. So if you replace all the fruits and vegetables with data, this is what your real world problem looks like. So if you talk about a little company or a small company which has three or four customers, they don't really need like big data because they can store everything on a, on a piece of hardware or they can even maintain a small database. But this doesn't work for a large company or a bank or an insurance company or a telecom company because point number one, it's costly. And point number two, there are a few challenges which we would be looking at very soon. And why big data at this point? Yeah, this is the question what we were talking about before. So think about major employers in your locality. Um, so they all have one thing in common, which is nothing but a huge consumer base. With a large consumer base comes exponentially large data, which means it grows in no time. 
So if this is the case, you need a lot of people to manage your data efficiently so that it doesn't risk your business. So a company like Uber can't, uh, I mean, they can't risk the customer data because if they don't have the customer data, they don't have the business. The same goes with companies like RBC, TD and stuff like that. Uh, they, apart from like bank balances, they also do a bit of trading and make money there. So if their data is not maintained and managed, this gets impacted, which means they lose on profits. Also, they lose customers. So that's why they pay a lot to maintain a team, a good team, which has data analysts, data engineers, and data scientists. Now, these are three different roles who will take care of your data at different, different levels. A data analyst is the one who is a person in, who, who is in between business and technology. He knows like what data TD has internally, and he also knows the business side of TD in the sense who is creating this data, who are the stakeholders, who are the end customers, where is this data coming from, where is this data going to? So these are like certain things a data analyst knows better than anyone else. And then there comes data engineer. A data engineer is the one who actually generates data or stores this data, transforms this data, or he's the one who processes this data. So there are, there, there are a bunch of things which data engineer does, uh, but data engineer is mostly technical. And again, data scientist is in between business and technology. So the end goal of data scientist is to, to decide how to make money from this data. So I can give you a little analogy. So let's go back and talk about the same restaurant case. Uh, this restaurant has a chef who's making the dish, right? So this chef is nothing but a data engineer. He brings all the vegetables and fruits. He stores it in a refrigerator. He chops it, cleans it. He'll make a fry out of it and he'll sell it. Uh, so this tasks which are being done by chef is most similarly compared to a data engineer. And who is a data analyst? A data analyst is the one who will understand how many fruits and vegetables you have, how many more you need, where should you bring them from, and things like that. This is what a data analyst typically does. So he knows what data you have, what fruits and vegetables you have in your store. He also understands the size of business and side of business, in a sense, uh, how many customers I'm going to have tomorrow, and where should I, how should I reduce my inventory costs and stuff like that. This is what data analyst thinks. A data scientist is the other one, he's also a similar one, but his goal is to make money out of a end product. So now our data engineer guy here is making a dish, right? So data scientist is actually the one who is selling this dish, who is making something by selling this dish. That's what a data scientist normally does. Uh, is this clear? Like the analogies are clear, right? Yeah, it seems uh, good. Uh... Yeah. And who is this course for? So this course is designed to help anyone who's looking to start a career in any of the data related roles. We'll be exploring various tools which are related to what I just spoke about, storing data, transforming data, processing data, which are absolute must for everyone, like a data analyst or a data engineer or a data scientist. There are tons and tons of roles available outside, which are a, a, a hybrid role between a data analyst and a data engineer. There is a role called data governance engineer and things like that. There is something called data ops engineer. So we'll see what these are. Uh, when we discuss uh, related terms for these very soon. And why Pragra? Pragra is a valued partner which helps you add a specialized skill on your resume. And in this class especially, I would be teaching everything on a Google Cloud Lab, uh, just like how you work in a company. So normally, like if it's a bank or an insurance company, they'll have everything hosted on a cloud, uh, like AWS server or Google Cloud Platform or Microsoft Azure. We'll be doing the exact same thing, but on Google Cloud Platform. I'll help you build lab session on your end so that you'll be more familiar with what you're doing and why you're doing. And you'll be given assignments and quizzes um, to put your skills up to date at the end of every class. I'll also help you build end-to-end -end data pipelines during scheduled projects. We have two such scheduled projects in the whole course, uh, just like how they do it in the industry. And the course syllabus, uh, we have a bunch of tools and technologies to learn. I don't really want to confuse you with all the names at this point. But yeah, we'll break them down into four main parts. There is something called ingest. There is something called store. There is something called analyze or process. There is something called display. And then you will learn what data modeling and data warehousing is. And then you'll also know what scripting, scaling, and building a complete data pipeline would be. And prerequisites, uh, you need an understanding of an operating system. A basic idea of relational database is quite important. 
and understanding of a programming language like python is at this point it's not really important but you'll for sure need it in the future because i'll be teaching you something called airflow uh, i can give you good resources for all these three at the end of this lecture so you can ping me for that if you want some nice resources and then class structure uh, it's not really relevant at this point but yeah i'm flexible with any timing uh, coming back to the technology part what exactly is ingest so this is what we'll see uh, so see this uh, if you have any questions just like please let me know or if you need any clarifications please please don't mind to ask okay now see this whenever you are cooking for your family you have your own backyard you have your own backyard right so let's call it point a and then there is your kitchen point b so here are your fruits and vegetables there are your like little like trees and stuff there are your like, potatoes and stuff i'm not like really good at drawing but consider the analogy so that's your that's your backyard okay that's your backyard now whenever you're like cooking for your family you'll manually go to this backyard pick these potatoes and plug these plants and you'll bring it to your kitchen right and you'll put it in the refrigerator so this process of going to the source and bringing data is called ingestion so the only thing what you're doing at this step is collecting your fruits and vegetables and you're bringing it somehow to your end this looks so simple when you're talking about your own backyard but uh, every thought which we would be discussing here would be on scale in the sense instead of like a kitchen you would be talking about a mcdonalds which is serving fries in this case going to each and every farmer who is uh, growing these potatoes and transfer it to some place and keep it safe and secure is a challenge we'll be seeing what that is very soon but this is the idea of ingestion now there is something called apache kafka and apache scoop which i would be teaching you in this session apache kafka is for near real time streaming data uh, near real time apache scoop is for batch data now what's the difference between near real time data and batch data so this is the difference so see if you ever observe a stock market chart or a forex chart or an application like uber it all happens with respect to time it all happens with respect to minute in the sense if the value of a particular thing is x in the next minute it will either go up or low right so if that's the stock exchange if this is price here and this is time it will be like this right or something like this that's a stock like chart which is performing uh with respect to time so in this case what is happening is this price has a value this let, let's say this is like microsoft stock msft um at like 7 am there is like one value at 9 am there is one value at 11 am there is one value at 1 pm there is one value at 2 pm there is one value so this is happening in real time so somehow all the systems which are trading on this stock should get this data very instantly there's no point in getting the updated price of stock after 10 minutes right you should be able to get it in near real time so that's when you use something called kafka we'll see what kafka is very soon and then there is something called scoop uh, scoop best works for batch data batch data is nothing but let's say you are walking into your local rbc bank which is saving all your detail, details in a database now at the at the end of every month they want to calculate how many customers join in let's say april so if you're doing this you can hold your data till april 30th and upload it on april 30th to rbc's like cloud right this is same as well as doing it on first doing it on second doing it on third once every day is also same there is no like difference because this is going to be evaluated on april 30th so there's no point in like ingesting it every day you, your data can wait your data is not really critical so in such case you do something called batch data so the other difference is near real time data is very small in the sense it will be like in kbs to mbs and this data will be typically in gbs because you are holding data for like a nice while and then you are doing it uh, that's the difference between kafka and scoop 
Kafka is for near real time data and scoop is for batch data and the other example what i could give you for kafka is so if you go to amazon or something uh, like an amazon store or something you'll see sometimes you'll see things on sale right you'll see that there is a flash deal which expires in 10 minutes uh, and there is a counter like below this which gives you time in reverse chronology in the sense it says like 10 then 959 958 somehow it is actually tracking the logs with respect to time and displaying this so the way it does, does this using real time streaming technologies uh, and a possible technology what they can use is kafka for this uh, so that's your ingest uh, ingest is nothing but bringing data from a source i mean where it is being originated to your premise on your end so that's called ingestion is this clear yeah the concept is that clear yep yeah. and then what is storage so whenever you are like uh, cooking for your family uh, we just discussed that you bring like potatoes and and stuff and you'll put it in your refrigerator right on your end that's your kitchen here that's your kitchen and inside your kitchen there'll be a refrigerator where you'll store everything right so you're storing it because you can use it in real time but most of the times you may like use you may have something in extra and you'll put it in refrigerators for future use so that's nothing but storage so when you're bringing data when you're ingesting data you typically save it somewhere or you can consume it too both are possible scenarios but if you are like storing it somewhere that's called storage there are a bunch of uh, storage tools which we would be seeing at this course we'll be covering hdfs hive cassandra and we'll be using mysql specifically uh for few projects in and out so what is hdfs uh, we'll discuss this soon but yeah hdfs stands for hadoop distributed file storage and then there is hive which is a data warehousing technology there is something called cassandra which is no sql database and then we'll see some sql databases on what they are and how people would be using these what is analyze analyze is nothing but sorry what is analyze analyze is nothing but now you have your fruits and vegetables in your refrigerator uh you have like potatoes you have your leafy vegetables here so you have to take these and you have to like chop it process it and in fact transform it simply so that you'll you you'll start you can start doing something so this is nothing but you're analyzing you can also call it transformation or processing so i'll be teaching you what spark is what map reduces and other stream and batching technologies we'll see something called nifi that's our data flow tool for this so this is what we'll look in uh look to learn in analyze and then what is display so uh display is mostly used by data scientists so they have to make dashboards to see what's in stock and how you're doing things or how you, how well you are making business and stuff like that this includes like pie charts like that uh pie charts like that or like line graphs like this or bar graphs like this projecting your business or trajectories and things like that so this i mean it makes no sense to give someone a database because they have to write a query they have to understand what's happening uh, it's hard but if it's a dashboard you'll understand it easily think about the dashboards for like the cases of corona what you're seeing around so it's it, it is most appealing when you have like something mapped onto a map like a map on a world map and to see like how well countries are doing and which country has the highest number of cases and things like that it actually has more impact so you'll also like create dashboards with your data our data engineer is not the one who mostly do it but our data scientist for a data scientist creating dashboards is an absolute basic so we'll see how to hook our big data to power bi power bi is a data visualization tool uh, the other data visualizations are something called tableau which is in market and there is something called looker which is like famous these days it's 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 really basic but yeah it's still famous um and there are like some other there is something called um i mean these are like some tools what you can use to create uh your dashboards we'll see power bi in this course and then uh what after this course so i'll be teaching you all the tools uh which are in crazy demand in canada uh, because i worked at both insurance company and and a bank too so i have like a knowledge on like what happens and like what people use because they have the exact similar project names uh yeah you learn 
all the tools required to become a data engineer. Uh, the most important thing is also confidence because you should be able to explain you what I'm teaching in, in the best sense. If I ask you to go through a documentation and remember things, it's really, really hard. And even I can't do it. I don't like to do it. So always someone who can explain things in a simple sense would be valued a lot uh, because he's adding his own perspective there. This comes with experience. And yeah, I would be helping you building some confidence on how to explain these things in the super simple way so that everyone will understand. In fact, I think I'll, I mean, my indirect goal is to teach you like you're 10 or 15 year old so that you'll, you'll grasp these easily. And then uh, I'll help you prepare for interviews. Uh, I have like a bunch of questions and I also have a set of questionnaires from all my previous students who gave interviews. Um, yeah, I have like a really big resource which I'll be giving you um, so that yeah, you'll learn all the skills which are related to this course. And then, yeah, what does a data engineer or a, or someone who will learn this course do like typically in their career? So these are four things which I did at various points in all my like jobs. So you'll work in a team which ingests data in the sense bringing your potatoes and vegetables from farm to your refrigerator, storing them, storing in your refrigerator appropriately you can't like combine meats and uh, produce right so they have to go in a different different thing meat should go in a freezer and your produce should go in like a chilling box and things like that so if not they'll go rot so yeah storing is also a subject of its own because there are so many things to consider on how to optimize things securely and safely and then analyzing models it's nothing but uh, what are you going to do with the data what you stored in the refrigerator is also an important point. Uh, so you'll be working in these parts or you'll work with ETL developers uh, and you'll be working on deploying your own models to cloud. And then you can also work with data scientists and machine learning engineers because they'll have a specific data requirement. So data scientists and machine learning engineers are the ones they who only work with clean data. In a sense, they should first speak to a data engineer if they want a data set. A data engineer is the one who will understand where it is coming from, how to sort it, or how to clean it, and then he'll give it to data scientists. In short, data scientists and machine learning engineers are exactly like the people who will market the food you cook. So, yep. And then, uh, yeah, let's see a data sample data pipeline of a ride-hailing application and relate what we understood so far. So, see this. So this is how Uber works. Uh, it's not like a solid example, but you, you can get most out of it anyways. So there is you here. Uh, that's a point. Oh, I can think I'll write it above. You're here. Your driver is here. So the way Uber works is, so whenever you're uh, ready to, to take a ride at to a specific destination, you'll open your phone. So at this point, you're opening your phone. Uh, that's a phone, and you'll open Uber app. So whenever you open Uber app, it automatically triggers GPS, which means it gets your location. And after this, it asks you where your destination is. Uh, let's call it airport. And then, uh, it also asks you what type of car you want. And there are a bunch of things it asks you. Uh, let's say car type, SUV. Now this data is generated on your phone at your home. Now this has to go to the Google's application, right? So it goes to cloud, which is hosting Uber's backend. Now there is a matching, there is a processing and matching happens here. So what ideally happens is now this backend should understand all the drivers who are in this specific location, right? Only they can serve you. There's no point in asking a driver from Montreal to go to Toronto or Mississauga to pick you up and drop at the airport. So that doesn't work, which means it has to match this location. It has to match this location to a driver using, let's say, our database. And then it has to match this destination to a database which says, all the possible destinations in a city. You can't really go in Uber from Toronto to New York City. So it has to limit that, which means it has to limit 
the application's performance to the city limits. So there is another uh, like database for limits of the city. And then car types. There'll be a there'll be a database which has car types. When you asked for an SUV, there's no point in sending your hatchback car. So now what happens is this backend algorithm, it does like an efficient match between all these three. In this case, it is processing here and it sends this to a database where this is stored for future use. And it is also sent to the driver. So now driver knows that you are requesting, right? He'll connect with you. So this is how normally it works. Here are a few things. So why is this a database? And why are they actually saving it to database? At this point, sending it to driver, your trip is fulfilled. The reason why they write it to a database is at some point, if they want to know how many trips happened in, in like Toronto in April. So they'll go and look at this database. So this database provides them the value on how many trips were taking place, how much they earned in a specific city, in a specific duration and stuff like that. Now, in this whole scenario, the point where the data is being generated and being sent to cloud is called ingest, ingest or ingestion. And this at this place, it is being stored, right? Like inside this, your data has to be stored. So there is storing inside it somewhere. And then this point is processing or transforming or analyzing your data. And yeah, again, there is ingestion, but one, two, three. And at this point, like someone will make a dashboard using this data to visualize. So these are typically the four steps of a data pipeline. You'll have an ingest phase, storing phase, processing phase, and visualizing phase. Is this clear? Yeah. Yeah. And then what exactly is Hadoop? Uh, here comes the question. Uh, this is the very first topic we'll be dealing with. What is Hadoop and why you should probably learn it? So again, let's go back to our farming example. So whenever you are dealing with your own crop, in a sense, your five kgs of potatoes, two kgs of onions, a kg of tomato. You don't need much space. All you need is a refrigerator. Of specific size or storage, let's say 30 liters or something like that. Now what happens is, since it's only your family, you'll first like save it here, store it here, store it here, and these get consumed. These get consumed like right away. But whenever you're dealing with a restaurant, this doesn't really happen because you can't grow your crop. You have to outsource it to a broker or a middle or a middleman who will deal with bringing you data. And he should ideally bring data like every day or every week or something. And you'll store this in like a giant storage because you have to like serve to a lot of customers. Now you'll have like a big refrigerator of like 300 liters or something, and you have to like put it. Now here comes the technology part or technically, if you're walking to an RBC bank, let's say Mississauga location, which has like 2000 customers in total. So in that case, all they need is a database, which is fine. This works for 2000 customers, it is fine. Now what if this branch is expanding or what if there's a new city coming here? And there are 2,000 more customers which are coming and joining in. Now, this database here, there are two possibilities. So let's give some values to this data uh, database. So this database is on a computer which has an 8 GB RAM. We're just assuming, okay? And a TB, 1 TB hard disk, okay? Now, let's say this data is growing because there are multiple scenarios where your data grows. There may be new customers coming in. Also, this, this bank should record all the transactions, right? So that's also data. So that also grows depending on how your customers are using money. And in that case, for the next year, if your data is 2 TB, it grows to 2 TB, you have two cases. You can either increase your storage size to 2 TB. Now you have 8 GB and 2 TB hard disk database. Or you can, what you can do is, you can bring a database, like the same 8 GB comma 1 TB database. And you can bring one more new database and you can put it next to it. So this scenario is called horizontal scaling. This scenario here is called vertical scaling. So there are a few challenges here. The first challenge here in the case of horizontal scaling is 
So if this becomes 2 TB, for the next year, again, it will become 3 TB, which means you have to add one more block here. So whenever you are querying a customer record in this, your query execution engine or compiler does a full table scan, which means it starts at the first record and it goes to the last record to fetch your details. So it has to go through all the 2TB records. In this case, your processing times would be larger. Your customer will be frustrated because your ATM takes so, takes so long to uh, accept his pin card and show his balances, which means they can't do this also. What if this, this RAM fails? In this case, there's a single point of failure, which means this all will be useless. Your data, you lost your data. So they don't really do this. And then there is something called vertical scaling in, in the case, in, in another case, where you'll add like a bunch of database as you are growing. In this scenario also, there are a few challenges. The first challenge is maintaining. Uh, let's say a new customer is joining in. Where should the new customer's data go? Here or here? Who's deciding it? And how is that optimized? So what if this has like 1 GB left? What if this has 10 GB left? Why not 1 GB from this is sent to this and this data is kept aside safely? And why not you're using this data from, I mean, this database from this point? So there are a few things like this to consider, which means there is a hell lot of maintenance headache here. Like infrastructure issues are a lot. So that's why you don't do this. So now you have like a better solution. So let's see what that better solution is. So here comes your new better solution that's called Hadoop. Oh. Here is your new solution, which is called Hadoop. So what happens in the case of Hadoop is, uh, let's go back to our like farmer analogy to understand what exactly Hadoop is. So there's a farmer. So this farmer is growing a specific crop. Also, he can't grow crop at all the times, right? So let's say he's growing like a hundred kgs of like potatoes. So the very first thing is, if it's like hundred kgs, he can store it in his in his house. So if you go and see outside on countryside, you'll see like a storage area like this, like outside every farm. He'll store it here. What if it's 1,000 kgs now? What if it's like 10,000 kgs like next day? He can't go on constructing these, right? So what he does is he'll first figure out a broker who will buy all these potatoes. Now this broker will also have a warehouse. Now what happens is he'll go and he'll put these in broker's warehouse. He'll first sell it at this point. So there's a big warehouse at a different location, that's important. Now, this farmer, like whatever he grows, 100 kgs, he'll put it here in a specific location called Locker 1, just call it L1. And a broker typically deals with a bunch of farmers, not just one farmer, right? There'll be Farmer 2, Farmer 3, Farmer 4. So they'll also come and they also use the same Locker spaces. And, and things like that. Now, this broker will have a kind of system where he'll have an account of every farmer and the assigned storage and other details, right? So he has to like make a make a record of all these so that he'll remember like who bought one, when and on what date and how much he paid for it and, and stuff like that. Also, he'll sell old stock first and things like that. So that's why he'll, he'll have like such kind of solution. This is exactly what Hadoop is. Uh, so I'll give you more example, uh, more examples very soon. But yeah, so Hadoop is nothing but data which is generated at a specific source is being transferred to a, a centralized location or a cloud location at a different general location where you are saving everything. And then you are taking whatever you need and processing it. So this is the idea of Hadoop. Is this clear? So uh, in Hadoop, I think there is nothing to do with the horizontal and vertical scaling, right? Like it's all cloud. Yeah, it's all cloud, but this, see this. So here you're not talking about horizontal scaling and vertical scaling because you're not doing it at the source side. 
you're first migrating it to cloud and this cloud is actually optimizedly storing and saving it so that's why you yeah. don't speak about it yeah so i mean uh, the horizontal and vertical scaling doesn't involve in hadoop at anywhere at any point of time so it's completely out of context i think exactly yeah. your, your hadoop is a single file system okay and see this uh so this is cloud based single file file system right yeah which means what you're doing is this is on cloud and if you want more space all you will do is you'll buy more space on a different cloud or on the same cloud that's it okay and yeah what what does a broker do if his warehouse is complete he'll go and buy another warehouse and he'll start like putting data in that warehouse right the same thing yeah so here there is no horizontal and vertical scaling because farmer is like doing it directly on is not directly like storing things on his end he's directly doing it on the broker side so he, yeah. whatever he is growing he is ingesting first and yes. and all the storage is being done here so you don't speak about it yeah okay yeah and then the next point so components of hadoop so what are the components of hadoop so hadoop is a framework uh, which was created in 2004 i believe so this started with all the browsers uh, uh, like google and yahoo so when in 2000s it was a golden time for all the browsers and internet companies so they were looking to save their data somehow in some way in a good and efficient manner so yeah because their data was was growing a lot there were users which were contributing to the searches and there were people who were generating content and then there were ads and stuff so google first came and they created something called google file storage and this was laid, the concepts were taken and implemented by yahoo as hdfs or hadoop, let's call it hadoop here and this was open sourced in a sense uh, there were a lot of people who contributed on their free time to develop this hadoop framework so this hadoop framework has three components there is something called hdfs that's where you store your data there is something called map reduce so using the data you stored you will process it with map reduce uh, map reduce app are is a company and then how are the resources being managed between hdfs and map reduce for this there is something called yarn so that's it so the most important point is this is a good interview question uh, is your hadoop is an independent entity that's a separate thing your hive is a separate thing your kafka is a separate thing your scoop is a separate thing so these are all independent projects but they all work with hadoop in the sense they all work with hdfs files so they all work with the data what's being saved in hdfs they can work with it they can work with it they can work with it so you have all these independent components are being managed uh, so that they work with each other without any glitches so yeah so that's the first thing and let's start understanding what hdfs is so see this uh the same thing hdfs is nothing but the storage thing what we just discussed uh we just discussed that there is a big warehouse uh, or a single storage location where your data is split and saved uh that's nothing but your hdfs so what happens in hdfs is so here is your file.txt you're generally using this file and you're uploading it to cloud so you'll send it to cloud this cloud here has hadoop on it hadoop framework so this hadoop framework now you have to like store this file.txt somewhere on the cloud for this there is your file storage component called hdfs so what happens to hdfs here is this file.txt will go and speak to something called master node there is something called master node or you can call it the main uh, machine and this controls a bunch of data nodes or slaves Uh, slave computers. Let's call it data node one, data node two, data node three, data node four. So whenever you upload the file dot txt, it gets split, and it also uh, the other important point is it should not lose your data, right? Uh, that's the other challenge what we were looking at. So to in order to do this, what it does is it replicates everything by three times by default. so let's say you are a facebook user or something 
and you have your photos saved on your facebook and what if facebook data goes down it looks ugly to lose photos on facebook right so what facebook does is it replicates all your photos like three times and it puts on different different locations so similarly this file node txt will go and speak to this master node this master node has three components i'll write it here there is something called name node there is something called secondary name node or backup name node and then there is something called job tracker uh these are the components of master node and then there is your data node I'm drawing it here data node has two components one data node and there is two task tracker so what happens in this case is so whenever your file dot txt here this is think about this as the as the data or fruits and vegetables which are grown by the farmer he'll take it and he'll speak to a supervisor or a manager right that's nothing but your ma master node he'll go to this ma master node and master node will kind of understands which of these locations have some space and it splits and saves this data which means this file dot txt will be saved here as a copy file 1 file 2 file 3 and this is empty for now just assume assume that now you have a, do a document where it saves it so your file dot txt is split between data node 1 data node 2 data node 3 and then your master node or your manager of this data or of this like storage location should understand it right which one is empty which one is empty which one is empty he has to understand he has to take care of all these right so what he does is this master node sends a signal call heartbeat to every data node every 30 seconds hey are you all right this data node responds back saying i'm well and good same thing with this i'm well and good i'm well and good if something doesn't say i'm well and good which means if if this doesn't get a signal it sends another signal after 30 seconds it waits and if that doesn't work well it sends one more signal at 30 seconds and if that doesn't work it will delete data in this data node and it will assign everything to this one now your data node 4 has file 1 so this data is gone right how did you get data in file 1 i mean how how did you copy file 1's data because you have you already have copies here f2 and f3 are same as f1 so you'll copy to f1 and this gets updated to 4 instead of 3 now someone will take these files and process it uh, let's say these are all like potatoes and you want to weigh everything so someone has to like weigh everything right they'll weigh so if if a farmer says i want to weigh all my potatoes so what happens is there is someone who is working in this for this manager who will go and weigh all the potatoes in that specific location he'll also do it at this location he'll also do it at this location he'll take all the counts 5 kg plus 5 kg plus 5 kg and he'll come back and he'll say i have 10 kg of all these so that specific person who is going and doing all the measurement is called job tracker so whenever a farmer says i want to uh, count all the count the weight of all the potatoes it goes to job tracker and job tracker will assign some slaves called task trackers task trackers are the ones who will go and do everything in parallel at the same time so weight of this will be found at the same time same thing same thing 5 kg plus 5 kg plus 5 kg and comes back and it says i have 15 kg uh, that's what a task tracker does is this clear yeah 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 so these are the components of Hadoop. I mean, in the sense, we just discuss what HDFS is. We'll see the architecture of MapReduce later. So this, what I, what I just taught you, the data node one, two, three, heartbeat, uh, the document. This document here, which is talking about the data, is called metadata file. If metadata file is lost, everything is lost because it it makes no sense because you'll never know like which locker is carrying which data, right? So there's a metadata file in Hadoop too, uh, which takes care of this. This is the architecture of uh, HDFS. in general and then oh that's what we discussed um yeah i think i'll i can teach you like next technology to let's talk about something called map reduce i have a few nice slides for it uh
Hi. Hello. Oh, can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a small, like, five minute break. Let's join back to see the next set of uh, tools. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. So, yeah, let's discuss more about uh, what we just learned. Yeah, so let's discuss about more about the concept of processing in Hadoop. Uh, can you just confirm if you are able to see my screen and hear me? Yeah, yeah I can see it. Sure. Yeah. And then let's take a look at Hadoop's cluster management and get an idea of associated components on how this is actually happening in real time. And let's start learning about an ingestion concept. We'll just like cover basics, uh, I mean, the concept, and then we'll go into the lab session later in the next class. Okay, so here it is. These are empty slides for me to draw. So yeah. So let's start talking about something called. Okay, hold on. So this is HDFS, uh, which we just spoke about. So there is something called. This is your master. That's your master there. These are your like data nodes. What we just like spoke about. Uh, this is the architecture. You can find the same architecture in HDFS uh, documentation. So you speak to name node, and name node speaks to all data nodes. And these data nodes are not connected, which means this data node can't speak to this data node. That's an important observation. Data node never communicates with another data node. Data node only communicates with name node, and vice versa. So you have to understand a few things. So master node. Data node. Name node only speaks and hears to data node. And if this name node dies, there is something called secondary name node, which takes this role. Secondary name node. And in this scenario, this speaks to data node and vice versa. And then there is something called job tracker which will go and speak to something called task tracker. That's it. Uh, and data node doesn't communicate with other, another data nodes. Um, yeah, this data node can speak with this task tracker, which is fine. But this data node uh, is independent in the sense job tracker will speak to all task trackers, but task trackers also similar to data node. They don't speak to other task trackers. Is this clear? In a sense, master speaks to all the like slaves, but slaves doesn't speak to each other. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then there is something called MapReduce. So MapReduce is the processing component of uh, Hadoop. Um, so as I just told you, Hadoop has like three components. There is something called HDFS, which is for storage. There's something called MapReduce to process your data. And then there is something called YAN to organize and uh, arrange all the resources. So this is the overall architecture of uh, MapReduce. So let's just assume your file.txt is here. So this is going to something called, uh, here there is your master node. There's your master node here. 
So as we just spoke about, I told you that this master node goes and splits all the file into different different locations, right? So it splits everything into data node one, data node two, data node three. Let's just assume your file dot txt is broken down into three different parts: data node one, in it's in data node one, it's in data node two, and data node three. Now, for an analogy perspective, these are nothing but your hundred kgs of potatoes, which went and spoke to the manager of that storage facility and this guy said i have like three lockers of 50k each you can go and put your put your data so yeah he he has like let's just assume he has like 30 kgs of potatoes here 40 kgs of potatoes here 50 kgs of potatoes here and now if this farmer wants to weigh all the potatoes like what he has so what happens so in this case what happens is uh, so these potatoes are like shuffled and kept somewhere. And then, so whenever he asks for a computation, what happens is he'll go and speak to a job tracker. So this job tracker goes and assigns this to task tracker. This is, there is your task tracker there, task tracker, third task tracker. So now this weighs everything which is here. This weighs everything which is here. This weighs everything which is here. And it says, I have 30 kgs. At this point, this output and this output are joined like 30 kgs and here you have 40 kgs. So that's total 70 kgs. Uh, and let's say here there is like 50 kgs. Uh, my math was wrong. Let's just assume. Yeah, let's just assume this is 120 kgs. And now here you have 50 kgs. Oh, it's 150 kgs actually. Now this is these are all added here at the output phase. Now it says, okay, you have 150 kgs of potatoes. So that's the idea of like map and reduce. The reason why you had to reduce was your data was split and now you counted it into all the different phases and then you got a single output again. So that's your like map reduce. This is a simple example, but I'll give you like a nice example now. Uh, so how well did you understand? Uh, I mean, how well did you understood this? Uh, speaking of the output, like uh, does the output uh... Uh, tells about the uh, amount of uh, the potatoes that are stored in that uh, storage or uh, like is it uh, something else like uh, yeah the... cool. uh, that's a good question so it doesn't need to know right it doesn't really need to know from where these potatoes came from right okay so uh, so you're a farmer you you're storing all the potatoes it's not your headache to see or worry about the choice of lockers you, you don't do it. The storage facility will take care of it, right? You don't yeah. need to worry about it. So they'll optimizely do it somehow. And whenever you are uh, asking them to count all the, or weigh all the potatoes, what you have, you don't need to know like where it was stored and all the details. You're fine so, with, if it's right, it's fine, right? So that's yeah. the same thing which happens. And may I know the, uh, what is the exact purpose of shuffle? Like, uh, is, why does shuffle work? Is it yeah, because of the I'll show you in a moment. So okay. your data is not a, a single potato always. It can have like tomatoes. It, ha it can have like whatever it is. So in this case, it's not like unique, right? It's ambiguous. It's not clear. You have like a bunch of things. Uh, in this case, Shuffle actually splits everything by type. So if you see this, everything has like a color. So I mean, I just gave you an example of single potatoes, but that's not the case with your data. Your data can have like many things. So if you see this, there are like different colors. In the phase of shuffle, these are like becoming unique again. Like everything which is violet is going here. Everything which is a bit dark shade of blue is here. Light shade of blue is here. In the sense, your data which is of the same type is being grouped together. Well, well, it means that uh, the data is streamlined to uh, one groups, like yeah, different yeah. groups of the same type. You can say that. I'll give you an example now, anyways. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good question. So let me let me like draw here. So this is an example. So as we just saw in MapReduce, you have like three phases, right? The shuffle. There is there is something called split. I can write I'll write it here. There is something called split. There is something called shuffle. There is something called sort. So the most basic example, if you go through the documentation of MapReduce, this is what you'll see. So let's say that you have a file.txt. Uh, and this file.txt, we are just assuming it. 
these are 10 lines uh and just like deal with five lines so the lines are uh let's say roses are red dot and then sky mm-hmm. is blue dot and then trees are green dot. so this is your file.txt and now let's assume you are storing it in hdfs file.txt will be saved across multiple data nodes in small chunks of files now your map reduce deals with writing a pro- program right we just discussed that map reduce is nothing but your processing component in the sense let's just do some processing on this file now we are interested to know the word total number of words in this in the sense we are, we want to count the words we are like counting words so we have to write a program for word count so what happens when you count all the words is it should somehow deal with all these and figure out all the words like what all the words are right so this is what this is how map reduce works so this file or txt when put to hadoop gets split first right that's the first phase so let's just assume it is uh, so this is like a 100 gb file uh, sorry 30 gb file and it is saving like 10 gb in one split so that's 10 gb that's 10 gb that's 10 gb we are just assuming okay so your split one has this data roses are red dot sky that goes to your first split and in the second split you have this this data is blue dot trees are and in the third split there is something called green dot now this is an easy scenario where we are understanding that there is only one replication but there will be like three replications like this so we are just looking at one replication for simplicity now what happens is now this split has all the things right now it somehow has to like split all the record or, or shuffle all the, for all the words right so what happens now at the shuffle phase is this is what happens it goes to the first location uh, at line 1 i have roses let's call it like space one and then it says it uh, it says this it it space one i have roses it space five we are just assuming uh, i'm not like super uh, deep into the exact thing it is six or seven the location but we are just assuming i have r so it at this shuffle it every it splits everything into like single type okay one i have one red i have one dot i have one sky so this happens at the shuffle phase now the same thing happens here for the next block of data so i have one is i have one blue i have one dot i have one trees i have one r same thing happens for the third split i have one green i have one dot now see this everything is split into a unique or a, a single data type right or a single type now at your sort phase what happens is it goes through all these and it it counts it so at sort phase is the place where first reduce happens in the sense how many rs are there in total uh, i'm sorry this is this is one uh, there is one r here two yeah there are two rs in the sense this is how it happens there are two rs uh there are one two three dots so first will be three like three dots and it writes everything and then like whatever is one one roses one red uh one sky and so on right now at this point it reduced everything and that's your final output word count now with this word count program what you have is you have you you knew that there were like three dots two rs one roses one red one sky and so on right so that's the idea of map reduce so let's go back a bit to see if that's what we spoke about or not so see this so your file dot txt which has like roses are red and all uh, was split into like small chunks and again like all the single types or all the specific scenarios were 
sorted out or shuffled out or kept out together and then they were reduced in the sense the count was added and then the count on everything was added out this sorry this violet thing is added with this one this one it become a bit bigger in the, just like how we have had three dots and it is reduced in the sense at this point now you will have a single file which says i have three dots i have two hearts i have one red i have one roses and all okay yeah it's clear okay. this, is, this is the most basic example of map reduce from the documentation yeah. okay yeah is this clear for everyone hello yeah it's clear yeah and then you have something called yarn so this is the third component of your hadoop which is something called yarn so why do you why do you have yarn so the reason why you have yarn is you're dealing with a bunch of data nodes right there are like there can be any number of data nodes you're expanding your uh, you want to scale your cluster you'll add some more space which means you are adding more data nodes there'll be like 50 data nodes for example there is one master node there is job tracker so someone has to coordinate all these someone has to say this node that okay you have 50 data nodes and in these 30 data nodes are empty 20 data nodes has some data two data nodes are dysfunctional and things like that someone has to maintain that resources and somehow distribute all these right so this is which is what yarn does yarn stands for yet another resource negotiator so the best part is you don't need to like program it this happens by default because you're using the whole framework of hadoop so you don't deal with like yarn or writing yarn or you don't deal with uh, all the resources it does it by default on your behalf that's why it's called resource negotiator so it it computes like what are what's the optimized space how much space is left what is, what is i mean which nodes are dead it does it on your behalf you don't need to worry about it so that's yarn so that's how it looks like uh so in this case you have like different nodes and there is your like master node so it just it just like goes to, it speaks to everyone and it keeps it uh balanced and then so we just spoke about something called i just told you that hadoop is independent Kafka is independent. Scoop is independent. Um, Hive is independent. So I told you that Hadoop was of kind of storing and processing technology, and these are all various technologies which are designed to process HDFS files, to process these files in different different ways. So here is the question: How does your Hadoop go and speak to Kafka? How do how is your Hadoop going and speaking to Scoop? Who is maintaining the resources? Who is actually saying Hadoop that hey you have to use Scoop and communicate with this person called Scoop? Who is saying that? For that there is something called Zookeeper, just like the normal Zookeeper, who will manage a bunch of animals which are independent. Zookeeper in this context will also go and uh, I mean it does balance between Hadoop and all the independent components. Okay. and then yeah so this is the definition of zookeeper from their website zookeeper is a highly available and reliable coordination system like a person who is managing and maintaining all the animals uh, distributed applications use zookeeper to store and mediate yeah because they have to like get data from hdfs and things like that right so they use zookeeper to store and get data uh, and then they'll also deal with configuration information in addition zookeeper can be used for event notification locking and priority queue mechanism in the sense it will decide like where data should go how data should be handled between two independent technologies and things like that okay so this is zookeeper yeah this is what it is kind of doing so you have like a cluster of five different nodes 1 2 3 4 5 each node will have its own master right but there can be only one master so it first elects leader in the sense hey this time you be the leader and you control all the nodes so it controls all the nodes and also it controls all the clients your client is nothing but data node 
So you understood the difference between yarn and zookeeper, right? Yeah. Yarn is specific for Hadoop framework. Zookeeper is for everything plus Hadoop. Okay. And uh, so, uh, in the field of information technology, uh, do you use both of them or uh, only one? Of course, right. Uh, so you you, you, can't, like, you can't get away with just Hadoop. You need some something to process these HDFS files much more faster, which means you'll start using some more technologies. So we just spoke about HDFS. HDFS is a storage technology in a sense. What are you are growing in your farm? Are being stored in a big refrigerator. Now here comes the question: What if you want your What if you want to get produce every day? So let's say. i'm growing strawberries today and i want to consume strawberries which i'm going growing today right now and tomorrow i have to again bring them and use it and day after tomorrow i have to again bring them and use it so this is a possible case right in this case hadoop is not just efficient you need something to process this every day so you use yeah. some called kafka for it so when you whenever you are connecting like two different technologies you use zookeeper for it okay yeah, yeah. that's the idea okay got it so this is let's talk about about ingesting data Ingesting data is nothing but as we just spoke about, bringing data from your farm and putting it in a refrigerator. Uh, that's why you are seeing this. You should also like kind of like sort it right. You should also understand what types of data you have. You can't really mix and match everything. You should like possibly keep it separate, um, just to avoid ripening. So that's what you do. So let's talk about something called Kafka. So what is Kafka? So I think I'll draw a nice diagram. Okay. So see this. So as we spoke, uh, we you just remember, right? We had a discussion about Kafka a while ago. So Kafka was to ingest data which are uh, in near real time, or yeah, whenever you want to ingest data in near real time, you, you'll use Kafka. This is what we thought. or this is what we spoke about right so this is how it looks like so whenever you are dealing with kafka i'll first give you an analogy and then we'll start comparing it with something else so let's say you are a farmer or let's first talk about consumer who is doing dealing with it so let's say there are french fries okay so these french fries are being they are sold at like different different places right so they are sold at Like McD, they're sold at Burger King, they're sold at A and W, and there is Wendy's which is selling it. There's also Costco which sells it. So these are like your places where you can get French fries. Now, for French fries, you obviously need potatoes. So how do you get potatoes? You can't really go and speak to farmer, right? You can't really go, like this McDonald location in Toronto. Can't really go and speak to a farmer who is in Cambridge and ask him to send him like some potatoes. He, they they don't really do it. So what they do is they'll speak with a broker, right? So this broker will ideally have the list of all the farmers, have all the produce from their farmer, from the farmer kept at his locality, and whenever like McD asks for some potatoes, he'll sell sell it to McD. Whenever Burger King asks for potatoes, he'll sell it to Burger King. So Burger King asks, and this broker fulfills it. Ask, fulfill. Right. Same thing with all others. Now this farmer, whenever he grows, so there is farmer. Whenever he grows potatoes, he has to go and speak. He has to sell it. So he'll go and speak to broker, saying, "Hey, I have ten kgs of take potatoes." and broker if he needs far, like something from a farmer he'll go and speak to farmer saying do you have any more potatoes no i don't have anything and then he goes to farmer to a farmer to says i have 10 kg of potatoes and now broker says i need 10 more this farmer to says no i don't have it he'll co communicate this with this farmer and this farmer says no i don't have it then he has to go to farmer 3 farmer 3 again fulfills it in which means broker is a person who is dealing with a bunch of farmers in a bunch of consumers but this consumer will never speak to this farmer this farmer will never supply to consumer this just doesn't work there should be some middleman and the idea of this middleman is he's kind of doing everything in uh 
he's kind of everything i mean he's doing the optimized way of distribution now here is a question so what if mcd asks for fries which are grown yesterday i i want potatoes all the potatoes which were grown yesterday can you just bring it so in this case he has to go and speak to this farmer uh if he had some crop from yesterday he'll sell it he'll sell it he'll sell it and it goes to all the restaurants now this is the idea of your kafka so there is a producer which is generating data and then there is a system of broker who is maintaining and managing this data and then there is a, a consumer who is consuming this data and this is all happening in real time in the sense this farmer who, who grows crop today will go and immediately say this broker hey i have what 10 kgs of crop which i got today and this broker immediately goes and speaks to burger king saying i have 10 kgs of fresh potatoes do you want it so this is all happening in this is not real time in for this example but this happens in real time now imagine instead of farmer you have data which is being generated at a stock exchange data which is important every minute data which is generated at mid market rates once every minute so this has to go in like milliseconds to this broker and from this millisecond to someone else who is using this data to make a decision on the trade whether to buy stocks or not so this should happen ideally in a millisecond or something like that right in near real time so that's why you use kafka is this analogy clear yeah it's it is clear yeah no see this so what is kafka kafka is a distributed streaming platform you understood why it is distributed right because your broker is not dealing with just one farmer is dealing with a bunch of farmers your broker is also dealing with a bunch of consumers that's why it is distributed streaming platform and a streaming platform has three key capabilities publish and record the to stream of records similarly to message queue or enterprise messaging system store streams of records in a fault tolerant durable way process streams of records as they occur kafka is generally used for two broad class of applications building real time streaming data pipelines building real time applications so whenever it is real time you will use kafka that's the blind way and what are these three let's just see that publish and subscribe to streams of records publishes there is a broker right so this broker is asking is publishing uh, so there is your producer who is farmer and then there is your consumer so your pub, your producer publishes an information saying uh, hey i have 10 kgs of potatoes and this broker will publish it to consumer saying i have 10 kgs of potatoes from this producer and now this consumer will if he wants it he'll subscribe this 10 kgs of potatoes right so that's nothing but you are publishing and subscribing to stream of records in 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 our case it's the stream of potatoes um and then store stream of records in a fault tolerant durable way so these potatoes should not be lost at any cost just in the case of data so you'll replicate it again using kafka this 10 kgs of potato stays as it is but you'll replicate it three times so that it's not lost in case of your data especially and process streams of records as they occur so this is farmer one this is farmer two this is farmer three so first all the potatoes from this farmer will be loaded here and then this farmer and then this farmer with respect to time who came first uh is accounted for and that specific thing will be uh inserted first is this clear uh yeah let's clear the process streams yes yes so this is a real example from uber um so uber uses kafka the the reason why they use kafka is to get data in real time so in all these scenarios they have to get data in real time right from rider so so in all these cases you have you should get data in real time right from rider from driver from apis from logs from maps you should get data in real time maps because you'll have like traffic details uh, logs don't think about it for now we'll see these later driver app driver also has a location rider also has a location so these should happen in real time you should see your driver's location in real time if not it makes no sense your driver should see your location in real time right so the data from these respective apps will go to kafka and this kafka will ingest it to adu and matching of your algorithms takes place here so that's how uber uses kafka this was in like 2016 i don't know if they are using it now or not but that's an example of kafka where it fits in a data pipeline now here are few components of kafka there is something called producer 
there is something called producer consumer broker cluster topic partitions offset consumer group i just explain you all these in a in the potato example but you you will be able to understand what these are now see this producer is nothing but the farmer who is growing potatoes right that's where you you're getting your data from that's where you're getting your fruits and vegetables from right consumer is mcd or someone who is like consuming this data and there can be bunch of uh, fast food restaurants which can make fries which means you'll have mcd burger king and w and all so that's why they are called consumer group is are these three clear yeah yeah now there is a broker guy who's actually maintaining or who's actually coordinating between this producer and consumer right that's a broker yeah. okay and a cluster is nothing but a uh, cluster topic partitions offset these are the things which we'll now cover we'll first cover like the simplest things now see this a topic is nothing but the name which broker is giving to this farmer now he is dealing with four farmers right f1 f2 f3 f4 so he should understand which potatoes came from this farmer which potatoes came from this farmer which potatoes came from this farmer and so on so he'll, he he should ideally give a name so that he'll not be confused so he'll say potatoes from farmer 1 potatoes from farmer 2 potatoes from farmer 3 and so on so he'll give a name the name is called topic okay okay now this broker like now this goes to a broker right now this broker will sit in a big location like a storage facility and he'll speak with a bunch of like farmers which means he have like different different storage locations it's a centralized like repository or a centralized location where he he has like multiple employees so this centralized location where he has like a cluster of space is called a cluster is this fine okay so now so cluster have, is nothing but a repository yeah cluster is a is a giant space uh, a giant okay. a, a giant single locality okay yeah and then you have to see what partitions and offset are these are pretty important for this i have to draw one more diagram so now see this so there is your farmer and there is your broker so farmer is growing some crop and he has to go and store it or sell it to broker and th this happens at a warehouse right broker sits in his warehouse right farmer sits in, in his field and all the potatoes should go from this field to this broker right somehow how how does farmer do that he'll transport it how does he do it let's say he just has a truck okay let's ju let's just say this truck can carry like 100 kg at at one on one trip okay now this farmer has 200 kg like 120 kg of produce or potatoes to sell so what, how how does he do it first he'll send 50 100 kg here he'll put it here 100 kg so first trip 100 kg and he'll come back and now in the second trip he'll carry 20 kg and he'll deposit 20 kg right second trip 20 kg so this limitation this size limitation which limits him to carry only 100 kg at a time is called partition partition size so your partition size is nothing but the to the total capacity of you carrying this produce or this data at once okay so in the case of kafka the partition size of kafka by default is 256 mb okay is partition clear yeah now so a broker should know which which data came first so he should have a system that okay on first trip i got 100 kg on the second trip i got 20 kg he should know which day, which potatoes came first right so that he'll like first put these and put these in the next trip so for this he'll assign a number like this so this number what he is assigning to partition is called offset okay okay yeah so this is the idea of partition offset i think now now you know everything uh, related to kafka now
So that's about it. So this is how it looks like the architecture of Kafka. There is producer. This is like nothing but your farmer one, farmer two, farmer three, farmer four. Farmer one, farmer two, farmer three, farmer four. Uh, this is your broker. Your broker has like a bunch of employees. One, two, three, four. And then you have like McD, AW, Burger King here. So this is the architecture of Kafka. So yeah, we'll see the Kafka lab in next session. Uh, now, so since you now know what like Hadoop, HDFS, MapReduce, and Kafka are, just go through some details or go through like internet and find like, some interview questions or things and see if you understood it well or not. And if you don't have any questions, which is well and good, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Vivek. Uh, he'll forward you my contact and I'll assign you some time so that I'll clear you all your details or doubts. Okay. Okay. Yep. So I think I'll end it here and I'll have I'll take any questions if you have at this point.